stand and join our leaders singing today. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you have taught us to keep all your commandments by loving you and our neighbor. Grant us the grace of your Holy Spirit that we may be devoted to you with our whole heart and united to one another with pure affection. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad for her. All you have loved her, rejoice with her in joy. And you mourn over her that you may nurse and be satisfied from her consoling breast, that you may drink deeply with delight from her glorious bosom. For thus says the Lord, I will extend prosperity to her like a river and the wealth of the nations like an overflowing stream. 
and you shall nurse and be carried on her arm and dandled on her knees. As a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. You shall be confronted, comforted in Jerusalem. You shall see, and your heart shall rejoice. Your body shall flourish like the grass, and it be, and shall be known as the hand of the Lord is with his servants. And his indignation against his enemies. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, our psalm today um, is Psalm 66, 1 to 8. And let, let's read it um, responsively by whole verse. Be joyful in God, all you lands. Sing the glory of his name. Sing the glory of his praise. All the earth bows down before you, sings to you, sings out your name. He turned the sea into dry land so that they might went through the water on foot. And there we rejoiced in him. Bless our God, you peoples. Make the voice of his praise to be heard. The second reading is from Paul's letter to the Galatians. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked, for you reap whatever you sow. If you sow to your own flesh, you will reap corruption from the flesh. But if you sow to the Spirit, you will re reap eternal life from the Spirit. So let us not grow weary in doing what is right, for we will reap at harvest time if we do not give up. So then, whenever we have an opportunity, let us work for the good of all and especially for those of the family of faith. See what large letters I make when I am writing in my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh that try to compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. Even the circumcised do not themselves obey the law, but they want you to be circumcised so that they may boast about your flesh. May I never boast of anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world, for neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is anything, but a new creation is everything. As for those who will follow this rule, peace be upon them, and mercy and upon the Israel of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Lord, you, Lord Christ. The Lord appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest 
to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. See, I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick who are there and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go out into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town that clings to our feet we wipe off in protest against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God has come near. Whoever listens to you listens to me. And whoever rejects you rejects me, and whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. The seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, in your name even the demons submit to us. He said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. See, I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing will hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. First of all, this part about snakes and scorpions makes me nervous. Many years ago, we were playing music at a little church near Sand Mountain, Georgia, and if you are familiar with that, it's considered the home of snake handling. And I, we went there in the evening. It was a small little church, and we were playing music, and at some point during our uh, service, I looked over to the left, and over in the corner area, kind of like that, where it was actually a little bit dim, dimly lit, and there was a snake box on that pew. And I knew that's what it was because it had screens on the side and all that fun stuff. And I said to my son, Jonathan, who was playing mandolin with me, and I said, hey, look, if you see anybody head toward that box, we're out of here. I'm sorry, concert's over, we're done. There is an interesting thing that we will note about that. What Jesus apparently is really saying is that anything that is put against you, that darkness puts against you, you can resist. Uh, because you've been given this power, this authority over those things, and that is to say the works of darkness. But let's talk a little bit about this peace discourse. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. Notice there's an exclamation point behind that. Peace to this house with real energy. And those people who understand peace, who are able to accept, receive, and return peace, well, that will ring in their ears. But those who cannot will not be able to accept it. And it's not saying that you take your peace back from them. You still say peace to this house. But if they're not willing to accept that peace, you don't lose your peace. And there's a problem that we tend to have in human society is that we give up our peace 
for the sake of things that we may take peace away from others. Or it may be very interesting that we don't necessarily want peace, though we think we do. So let's look at this for just a moment. What is peace? And I think that, first of all, our response is the absence of war. So if the absence of war is peace, why do we not have peace? Because notice, we never really have real peace apart from knowing the saving grace. We don't have that real contentment that Paul calls the peace that passes understanding. It is so deep that it's impossible to describe in real terms. It's a peace that guards us and protects us and guides us, but it is not a peace that comes automatically. We're not just born with peace, although maybe we are in a sense because I, I, I love the innocence and honesty of children. They will say things that you would never expect, and they often don't really mean anything by it. Um, I'll give you one example. We had a bishop's visitation once at St. Clement's there in, in Rancho Cordova, California, when I was there. And um, there was this young fellow who was, a, he was an adorable young fellow, highly intelligent, which made him a little bit irritating. It, 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 you know, the highly intelligent kids are very active and, and tend to get, be irritating, so you have to really learn how to work with that and, and guide them. Uh, but this little guy was running back and forth into the back room where the bishop was getting ready, and we were preparing for the service and all of that. And the bishop said to the, to the young man, would you please go tell your mother that she needs you? <laughs> and the little boy goes out there, and he says, Mom... The guy in the funny hat said, you need me. If you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, just look at the bishop's picture. Okay. How do we find real peace, and where does it come from? First of all, this authority that was given is an authority to give peace to others. I think the exclamation point makes that even clearer. Peace to this house. When we approach anyone, isn't it the best idea to approach them from the standpoint of peace? Because if we have peace within us and we're able to share that with others, then we are doing this work of Christ in bringing peace to the world around us and bringing peace to individuals. So let's look at, for example, this, this realm of peace. For example, on the world scale, if you recall the movie Miss Congeniality and when every contestant came up, what would be your wish? What, if you could do anything, what would, you, what would be your wish? And they all said, world peace. They'd stand there with their smile and their beautiful gowns. Oh, world peace. Until Sandra Bullock's character gets up there. What would you like, like to see in the world? And she says, well, that would be harsher punishment for probation violators. And there's the long silence. And then she says, and world peace. And they all break out into applause. Because I think that's one thing that most humans could agree on. We'd like to see world peace. But what is world peace? Is it the absence of war? No. Because all around the world, there are injustices going on. At every moment of every day, there are injustices taking place. And that is not peace. And the question is, just because you have bigger weapons, does that mean that that's peace? If you can intimidate those who make you themselves your enemies, it, does that really bring peace when you have the bigger weapon? And that's the only reason that we're not fighting, because that's not peace. How do we find that? Well, unfortunately, we're only going to find world peace one way, and that is when Christ comes again in power and great glory. When the kingdom of God reaches its total fulfillment here on earth, we will have world peace. And until then, the only thing we can do is pray. Pray that there will be peace in the lives of every human being. Pray that God will move his spirit upon every living soul. That's as far as we can go. Now, let's bring it a little closer. What about peace in our nation? We are so divided. We're having trouble talking to one another. We can't share ideas because as soon as you share an idea, somebody's going to kick you in the face about it. Like on Facebook, have you seen that post that says, okay, I want to prove that people will argue about anything. Here we go. The sky is blue. And yes, I know it's a joke, 
But there will be people on there arguing and hating back and forth, and, and maybe that's all good fun. But look at the real hating that takes place whenever an idea is put forward. There's always going to be someone that wants to stomp it out for whatever reason. And maybe it's that image that if we stand on top of somebody, we feel bigger about ourselves. Well, there's part of our problem. Remember the selfishness issue. If you go all the way back to the beginning of the story, this whole Garden of Eden concept, right, what is the real issue that started all this? Selfishness. Oh, God says that you can't eat, you can, you can't eat of the fruit of the, the trees. Oh, no, no, God didn't say that. God said we just can't eat from that one tree. Oh, well, you know why? It's because God's afraid of you. If you ate that fruit, you would know you'd be just like God, and you wouldn't need God. Now, I'm paraphrasing that, but those, that's basically the story. You wouldn't need God because now you would know good from evil. Wow. So God's been holding out on us. So there's where selfishness, I believe, comes in, that God's holding out on us. We want something we're not supposed to have. And look at how we operate as humans. We generally always want something we're not supposed to have. So how do we find peace in our nation? We're going to have to find some way, if this is ever going to happen without the coming of Christ, if it's ever going to happen, we've got to find a way to talk again. Well, here are my thoughts, and not be returned with, well, that's just a bunch of nonsense. Well, now, wait a minute. Whatever happened to the time when you could share your ideas and the others share their ideas, and then somehow you work it out and you figure out that all together you might have the best idea? No, it's got to be about me. I have to have the right idea. No, 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 I have to be in charge. That's that inwardness that comes from selfishness, and that is an evidence of the imperfection that we are all burdened with. But we can slide off into that at any time. We can argue about anything you want to argue about, and we can go tooth and nail about it. And in our society, people are killing each other over things like ball games. It's that inwardly turned focus that says, it's about me. Until we can overcome that, we're never going to be healed as a nation. What about our communities? The same thing applies. Our communities are divided by ideologies where people have become so entrenched in their beliefs that they're ready to fight for them. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't have beliefs and be, be firm in those beliefs, but when our belief turns to fighting, what have we really done? Where's the, where's the peace? Where's the justice in fighting over something just because it's your opinion? Now, the problem is that we want to fight about truth, perhaps. I don't know if I want to say fight. Let's just try to get rid of that word. We want to stand for truth and confront darkness. So maybe even without using the word fight, we're confronting darkness with good. At what point can we say, well, maybe my viewpoint isn't the most important one, and maybe I don't always get it right? I mean, we'd all love to get it right all the time. It would be, be marvelous if we always made the right decisions, always said the right things. It would be great, but we don't. And instead of repenting of that, we tend to fight for that. And I'm going to use the word fight there. We tend to fight for that. So now it comes down to the family. How do we have peace in the family? Well, now that's interesting because it's kind of the same answer. We have to talk. We, families don't talk as much as they used to. And so we need to talk more about these things. What's going on in the world around us? Not necessarily what the news says, because we've talked about this a lot of times, that it depends on which channel. Just remember that the news is a scripted play. It's a scripted program, and it's designed to make you believe something that they want you to believe. And so when you change the channels from one to the other, you can tell where their focus is. And, and it's all, mostly about you should be really afraid is what it's about. And we tend to focus on the bad, not the good. And I heard something a couple of weeks ago or so where someone said that they used to always feel like, oh my gosh, we live in such a terrible time and it's just, it's going to get so bad. And if the Bible is actually literal in what it says about how bad it's going to be, oh my goodness, this is a terrible time to live. And they've taken, they took that whole angle, this is a terrible time to live. And then this person said, but suddenly one day I realized this is a great time to live because if you're a believer and you're firm in your faith, this is a great time to live. We just might actually see it happen in our lifetime. And I thought, now that is a cool angle. We are so fortunate to be seeing Scripture fulfilled. 
That brings me back to a Facebook meme I saw the other day, and it was this person looking out the door of their house with their eyes wide open, and the caption was, I'm looking to see which chapter of Revelation we're living out today. And it is an exciting time to live when we're seeing all of these prophecies come true, and and Christ is going to come again in power and glory, and we're going to say hallelujah because we're not afraid. So how do we help others not be afraid? See, it comes back to peace starts with me. So I'm going to quote Mother Teresa two times. She wrote at one point, peace begins with a smile. How many times have you walked in a public place, for example, and you, you see someone smiling, and don't you, doesn't it make you want to smile? It's, it's interesting how that works. But if you share a smile with someone and they don't return it, what's our response? What the heck with you? <laughs> Blew the whole thing right there. The idea of of demonstrating peace is that we're willing to smile for people and hold the door for people and say, hey, have a great day. And notice there are so many times that people will say, hi, how you doing? And then they walk away. They didn't really care how you were doing. Sometimes you ask how you're doing and you really don't want to hear it because it ends up being the whole Old Testament of how they're doing. So you just say, hi, have a nice day. It comes back to us. And here's another one from Mother Teresa. All works of love are works of peace. So let's take the peace that we find so elusive and go back to where we were just a moment ago. Selfishness came into the human picture, and it blew everything up. And it started out with Cain and Abel, the jealousy over God's favor where brother kills brother. What a great way to start the story right there in the very first few pages of the book. But we have to overcome those urges to be selfish because everything that we read in Scripture that says don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, the reason it says don't do it is because doing it is an act of selfishness. If you boil it all down, that's where we get in the most trouble is I want it my way. It's me. I want want what I want. And when we want something that strongly and we're willing to then then shift to fighting, we've lost the whole concept of what this human picture is supposed to be. So where does peace begin? It begins in me and in you and in each individual. Peace begins right there in the heart and mind. So we find that peace by acknowledging that Jesus Christ was real, really did, really did live and die, appeared to over 500 people after resurrection, was seen ascending into heaven. We believe this really happened, not just because it's in the Scripture, which is the most published book of all time and the most told stories of all time, but there are also secular historians that say that these things happen. So we start there. We believe that. And then we go to the story where we understand that selfishness entered the human story and that Messiah had to come to buy back the perfection that we never had, or or that is to say to give us that perfection we never had by the clothing that is Christ. And then we begin to work on our walk. And here's, here's where we start questioning ourselves. Am I living peaceably? Do I behave peaceably to others? Do I live in love? And that is to say that I'm willing to love even those who don't love me and take it a stretch farther. I'm willing to love those who hate me. Now, that's a big push, but that's what we're called to do little by little. And you take just one step at a time. How can I be more peaceable? How can I be more loving? How can I be more understanding? How can I be more tolerant, more inclusive? How do I do this? And we don't get overwhelmed with this whole picture, but we take little pieces at a time. And little by little, we start to experience that peace that passes understanding. That peace that's, and I, and I hope you have felt this. For me, it's this, those moments when I can say, wow, I just, I just feel so good. Now, the problem with that, if you, when you first start feeling it, is kind of like a Nickelback song. Something's got to go wrong because I feel so good. Yeah. Isn't that exactly the way that it, that'll happen? Boy, something's going to happen. I'm waiting for the shoe to drop. I just feel way too good. Everything's going way too right. Something's got to go wrong. And I wonder how often we live into that because we just can't believe how good we feel. It's, it's beyond thought. So we're thinking, oh, something's got to be wrong. Well, so we have to work to overcome that one step at a time. So the idea of peace begins with you and I. 
It begins in our hearts and minds. It begins with us recognizing the value of every individual, the beauty and uniqueness of every individual, and how even though we are all so totally different, together we paint this one perfect picture of God. But we have to stay with it in a world that appears to be crumbling. But what joy we have in seeing this all happen. Because now, we can, if you've been following the way of Christ for a while, and you're seeing what's going on in the world, you can probably think to yourself, oh, yeah, yeah, we've been reading about that for, oh, my goodness, all my life. We've read about those signs of the times, and we're seeing them. Isn't this a joyful thing? So our goal is to have that peace that says, when Christ comes over that hill, we can say, yes, come, Lord Jesus. Not, oh, no, no, wait, wait, not now. So we want to have the peace. Thanks be to God.